Good evening again. Uh, thank you everyone to, for coming this uh, hot summer evening to uh, my lecture and uh, thanks a lot to Deron for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to the organizers of this uh, series of events, Ukrainian Jewish Voices at the National Library of Israel and for the kind invitation to have my lecture today for this um, uh, audience. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the role of violence in the processes of Jewish westward migration from Eastern Europe. Uh, I will examine the anti-Jewish rights in the Russian empire, commonly known as pogroms, as a push factor for migration. Uh, also, I will look uh, at uh, microhistorical cases of violence and population movement uh, as its aftermath. Uh, at the same time, today's talk will shed light on the myth uh, mythologization of pogroms in Jewish historiography. Um, I would like to start with spending uh, a few uh, short moment on the uh, term uh, pogrom uh, as uh, uh, most of you know, uh, <coughs> know uh, today pogrom uh, commonly used in very different uh, contexts of uh, Eastern and Central European history, but originally uh, pogroms were anti-Jewish rights in the Russian Empire in 1881, 1883, and 1905, 1906. Beyond its original meaning, scholars uh, actively use this definition to describe the events of anti-Jewish violence during the civil war in the Russian Empire, uh, attacks against Jews in uh, Lvov uh, of uh, 18, 1918, uh, and even uh, Nazi anti-Jewish actions. Moreover, uh, the non-academic use of the term, uh, examples of which you can see on this slide, uh, uh, in literature, media, went uh, far beyond Eastern, uh, Eastern European and uh, Jewish history contexts, which of course uh, create a lot of challenges for scholars of the pogroms when we are referring to this historical phenomenon in the Russian Empire, our listeners very often have very huge variety of connotations, huge variety of associations with this word, uh, and uh, definitely term is uh, overused, which uh, blur original meaning, but in my research and in this particular talk, uh, I uh, use the term pogrom only in its original historical sense, uh, and uh, as synonyms, I also can refer to anti-Jewish violence and rights. Um, so just to be clear about the definition, def the main definition for us today. Um, let's now move in time and space a bit. And uh, we are uh, moving to uh, May 1881 to a uh, small town, border town, Volchiska, uh, border town of the Russian Empire, which nowadays is the town of Khmelnytsky uh, Oblast in Ukraine. Uh, here you see uh, Volchiska on the uh, right uh, border uh, in between, and Pit Volochiska on the left, it's already Austrian territory. These two towns were one city before, uh, partition of po partitions of Poland, but by this time, by 1880s, it's two separ uh, towns separated by border that uh, are, of course, connected, but not uh, in um, official way. And uh, uh, in Volochiska, in Russian border town, uh, in uh, early May 1881, we uh, Sources uh, provide us with uh, uh, very uh, uh, unique for this region case of pogrom that took place from May 3rd to May 6th in this uh, city. Why I'm saying uh, unique 
because uh, generally we will uh, look at it later. Uh, this uh, western part of the Russian Empire was not much affected by the pogroms in the 1880s, so rather southwestern part. Uh, also, this pogrom is quite unique because uh, the violence also challenged the border. It was extremely close to the border and it was uh, uh, basically affecting the dynamic of this border. And um, in 1881, uh, in November 1881, um, uh, there was a court that dealt with these uh, events. And uh, due to this court, we know quite well, uh, hour by hour, what was happening in the city. Uh, also court uh, portrayed some uh, pogromists for us. Uh, so that's how court uh, records uh, begin. For those of you who are using smaller screens, I will read this quote. The pogroms began on, my, on May 4th at nine o'clock in the evening. A crowd led by Austrian subject Petlevani carrying bats, crow bats and hosts attacked the tavern of Jewish man Sima Rosin. According to his information, the damage mounted to 3,000 rubles. The peasants beat his wife and stole a string of uh, pearls, rings, and 435 rubles, which she had hidden in her uh, stocking. Their best clothes, two samovars and uh, copper, pots, copper pots were stolen. Then the crowd moved to the house of Mortko uh, Porcelan whose uh, property was partly destroyed and partly looted. According to him, the damage was 10,000 rubles. The crowd beats his wife and children and, and stole 225 rubles from uh, the wife and, two, uh, and 412 and 575 rubles from the sons. Sorry for such detail. Um, mm, uh, quote from this document, but it's just to give you a taste how these court materials usually look and how in detail they are investigating what is happening. And with this quote, we already could, um, and, and court materials generally, but with this quote particularly, we already could challenge two uh, quite widespread uh, images of the, uh, about the pogroms in the 1880s. And first idea uh, this, uh, is that Russian imperial state did not punish the pogromists and uh, officially supported them in some way. There is also historical explanations about Russian state being one of organizers of, of, of the violence. But in this case, we see uh, that there is quite particular case of court after which um, about uh, 10 people went to the prison as uh, pogromists and the uh, state is not somehow um, uh, taking their part. At the same time, the idea of state responsibility is, is not uh, a total uh, miss or, or uh, you know, just a, an uh, imagined thing because if we are speaking about not state generally and not state officials of higher rank. In many cases, state representatives in the cities were rather bystanders or even participators of the pogroms. But here we are speaking rather about individual level. Another um, image of the pogroms that is also quite widespread, uh, challenged by this quote, is the uh, idea that uh, pogroms had very uh, bloody nature and uh, brought high uh, fatality, uh, high number of fatalities to the shtetls. And of course, uh, this idea originate not from the pogroms of 1880s, but from uh, later, uh, later uh, in cases of anti-Jewish violence, especially from anti-Jewish violence during civil war, where uh, when uh, for sure these pogroms were really uh, uh, bloody and uh, we have many, many casualties and uh, martyrs uh, could be found in uh, historical sources. 
And but in the 1880s, um, mm, we have not not so many uh, acts of um, of uh, murders, and uh, it, in, uh, in most of cases, we are speaking about not murders, but about plunders, uh, plunders people who are uh, targeting uh, some Jewish property to stall. And of, but of course, we are not, we cannot ignore violent element, uh, and uh, even in this quote, we see some. Uh, uh, violence again against uh, women and kids and uh, other Jewish population, but uh, these um, mm, images of the pogroms as uh, events with uh, high fatality rate and something supported by state could be uh, also questioned by such sources. Uh, but uh, what is not uh, clear from this kind of sources, uh, I'm showing this uh, Re, uh, records from court uh, because we have uh, many descents of them around the Russian Empire uh, trying to understand what happened, who is responsible, how many uh, rubles were stolen. But uh, what these courts are ignoring, uh, it's move, movement of people because in uh, many cities, many towns where violence occurred, uh, Jews uh, are try were trying to escape this violence. They were moving uh, to the neighbor towns, to another regions, to another countries, to sometimes even to another parts of the city. If we are speaking about bigger cities, but uh, this movement is something that uh, state bureaucracy do not catch in their uh, in their. Um, mm. Uh, documents and uh, here, of course, uh, Volochysk uh, being very close to uh, the border uh, exactly provide to us this unique case because, uh, in terms of sources, also because uh, the events are reported by uh, Austrian press, uh, Austrian correspondents are watching basically this. Uh, uh, events uh, across the across the border across the border rivers bridge and reporting about uh, mm, many people leaving the uh, city and uh, attempting to cross the border. Some uh, Vienna newspapers like uh, Neue Freie Press even wrote about uh, uh, wrote uh, not a single Jew has uh, stayed in Volochysk. Of course. Uh, we cannot uh, check if all uh, 160 people, uh, uh, Jew Jewish people left the city at one moment and probably these journalists are using some metaphorical kind of language, but uh, um, still we, we see hundreds and hundreds of people who are crossing the border, who are leaving the city and border here provides unique opportunity to catch their movement, to see uh, how exactly uh, they are leaving uh, the epicenter of uh, Jewish anti-Jewish violence. So here we see the border and here we see the bridge between two empire where we actually can uh, trace this uh, movement of uh, people. And here I have another uh, quote for you, uh, which is uh, uh, now from Austrian newspaper, uh, Neue Freie Press. Uh, and uh, here, um, journalists uh, describe uh, the following event from Volochysk around midnight and May uh, 15th, but we are uh, meaning May 3 in Russian Empire. There were uh, cries of limitations and screaming for help followed by storm bells with uh, three intervals. Hundreds of women, uh, mostly half naked, mostly poorly dressed with babies in their arms. And the rest of the children with them were rushing towards the Austrian border, roaring and uh, shouting, but the Russian border service would not let them cross. As a result, there were house and they ran into each other. Several of them broke hands it was a sad scene. Finally, the barrier was raised and a massive, massive crowd of Jews uh, rushed to the city. 
were in uh, part, when in part they uh, camped on uh, their ground, wandering uh, the, uh, the streets. Um, so here we see also um, very dramatically described uh, scene from the border and uh, also to add the context, uh, this article, which was published uh, a few, day late, few days later, was not just a strict report for the border. It also was a um, part of campaign launched by uh, this newspaper to gather money uh, from uh, citizens of Vienna to help the Jews, Jews in Galicia. So that also could explain the style of writing and uh, could um, uh, make us questioning uh, if uh, all details described are um, corresponding to real events, but uh, uh, what we see here, it's um, very close to what different sources are saying about the way uh, these people were crossing the border. Uh, and uh, what happened actually next? So there is a city with the violence in it, with the pogroms in it, and people are uh, crossing the uh, border or just leaving the city if it's not border town. But in this case, they are reaching Habsburg Galicia uh, by this bridge I mentioned before. Uh, this bridge actually exists even nowadays in uh, another form, but still uh, one could walk uh, through this bridge and uh, at least imaginary crossed border of two empires. So uh, these people, uh, came to Habsburg Galicia, and uh, they were not the first pogrom refugees there, because uh, in 1881, 1883, Galicia hosted about 25,000 uh, Russian Jews. Uh, many uh, of them originated from uh, different places uh, that were uh, that <coughs> where pogroms took place. Others. Uh, came to Galicia later or from another regions from, uh, of empire. And um, uh, here we have um, big, quite big methodological, but also kind of ideological question if we could call all of these people, all of these 25 recorded, but probably more not recorded Jewish refugees of the pogrom, could we call all of them refugees? Could we uh, imply this term, which is actually widely used uh, uh, back then by uh, newspapers, by officials, both in uh, German and in Polish language. Um, because uh, if we uh, proceed their list, uh, at least uh, pa uh, part of these people, they, their names and, and uh, some uh, demographic information end up in the list uh, conduct in the list and conducted by the police. If you proceed uh, this list, we can see that a uh, significant part of them are uh, came, came from the regions that were not affected from the, of the, by the pogroms. And especially later in 1882 and 1883, we see that more and more people from the Russian Empire are coming to Galicia. Uh, not because they are phys physically endangered, but because they uh, learned about possibilities uh, to for westward migrations that are created in Galicia for the Jews from Russian Empire. Uh, here you could see an uh, image uh, that was in, uh, uh, published in the French uh, newspaper Le, uh, Le Monde uh, in 1882. Uh, portraying one of camps of Jewish refugees on the border. Uh, and um, this image is very important in terms uh, of uh, how it's described. It, it's described as not as Jews who, uh, who left the Russian Empire, but Jews who are ready to return to the Russian Empire. And uh, what uh, interesting is happening in Galicia that uh, most among these pogrom refugees are returning to the Russian Empire, are returning to their uh, towns and cities that they left. And uh, if we are coming back to the case of Volocheska, actually we have 
much more complicated case while after this scene I just portrayed you with the help of a quote from Austrian press. And next morning, most of these people went back to the Russian side of the border to pick up their uh, valuable, valuable belongings. So we see that uh, this, uh, uh, these cases are much more, more complicated than usual historiographical image about people who are leaving after the violence to reach some Western destination, usually some uh, uh, golden uh, golden Western lands, uh, as uh, it was called by, uh, by press and uh, meaning the United States. And uh, when I was speaking about infrastructure and possibilities for Jews to migrate further from Galicia that attracted many people who were not affected by the programs, I meant um, the international uh, relief action that was created, uh, so not created, but developed in response to the pogroms and to the crisis on the border, uh, and uh, previously uh, created international Jewish organizations as uh, uh, Alliances Velita Universal in, in Paris uh, were joined by uh, several uh, committees around Europe and uh, with their, and also in the US and with their joint actions they created quite advanced infrastructure uh, to uh, facilitate westward migration from Galicia to the west and here after this uh, infrastructure was created and after they built network of western donors who were supporting further trip from the imperial border to New York uh, through different European destinations, we see uh, how the uh, idea of uh, pogrom refugees, of persecuted Jews, is becoming uh, very much uh, used by uh, international migration businesses who are trying to use, uh, for example, smugglers who are advertising this possibility in Galicia uh, to of uh, reaching west, uh, they are advertising this possibility in western region, western regions of Russian Empire, uh, with uh, of course with aim to uh, took some money from the Jews and uh, move them uh, through the, uh, the border. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see very um, uh, different cases about uh, how this relief action worked. For example, at certain point. Uh, uh, we, uh, we see here uh, on the uh, picture uh, Moritz uh, Friedlander, uh, who was uh, on, on, <coughs> on the uh, right, who was the representative uh, of uh, uh, Al Al Alliances Veilid from Vienna uh, in, uh, in Brode, uh, Galician border town, probably known for many of you. So, and uh, Moritz uh, Friedlander in his diary from Rode is writing about a huge challenge that uh, many of local Jews from Rode and from another border area are pretending to be Russian Jews to receive uh, some kind of free tickets or some kind of financial support for, uh, for their journey to the West. And uh, this also uh, show us uh, the complication of uh, uh, just straightforward understanding of uh, this movement as movement of pogrom uh, refugees. Uh, but of course, uh, here you can see a picture uh, from o Austrian National Library. Here, uh, it's uh, uh, Alliance, uh, Paris Alliance, represent, uh, Paris and Venice Alliance representatives with uh, uh, Russian Jews who are staying in Galicia. On the back, you can see military tents that were used for uh, to accommodate part of them. We could see, uh, we could find these military tents in, ma in many other uh, textual sources. And these pictures, uh, these kind of pictures were uh, sent to uh, different international organizations supporting this relief action as uh, part of reporting about uh, the uh, help that uh, 
representatives of, of these organizations are providing to Russian Jews uh, in their uh, way to the West. Uh, and of course, this kind of uh, pictures and this kind of materials from Galicia very much uh, influenced the understanding of uh, westward migration as one that uh, started and were uh, and was uh, pushed by the uh, anti-Jewish violence in the 1880s. Uh, and actually, if we are mm, trying to uh, construct this or support this traditional lineal idea about uh, Jewish migration, that there is uh, persecuted Jewish individuals uh, in uh, one of distant uh, Russian imperial towns who are trying to escape this uh, region due to the violence, due to the anti-Semitism, they are moving with the help of this international relief uh, to the West, we actually could do it uh, to su support this uh, existing historiographical hypothesis. For example, here you could see a uh, family, uh, Rosenstein family, uh, they are, uh, they were moving from Yelisavetgrad, place where first program occurred in 1881. Uh, so we can see them in the border record from Brode. We can see them in the uh, Hamburg passenger list. And then we can see them in the list uh, of uh, people who are, were arriving to Ellis Island to New York. So, and we could uh, build this uh, kind of straightforward uh, classical but in a way stereotypical uh, line of uh, migration to the west by these people who are so we don't have clear um, so, uh, source to state that they were somehow affected physically or in another way by the program but definitely they are originating they, they were uh, so their origin is Yelisavetgrad place of pogrom so we could have this uh, uh, lineal model uh, supported by so by the sources but at the same time uh, this map uh, uh, which represent this classical historiographical understanding of the process uh, is ignoring uh, many other things. Uh, and these things are uh, multiple uh, movement that we can see in the uh, Russian Empire, in Galicia, and even in New York. So people are not just uh, participating in some kind of exodus from the Russian Empire. They are uh, not only uh, moving to the West, there is uh, huge waves or of return migration. There is uh, uh, human trafficking. There was also uh, developed marriage market when accomplished uh, immigrants were uh, basically, mm, uh, we could use this word with quotation mark, ordering quite from Eastern Europe. There were special agencies developed for it in the 20th century. And uh, uh, if we are speaking about Galicia as this first migration point of passage where we can trace this uh, movement from the empire on the borderline, we are speaking about uh, mixed migration, not about any kind of lineal migration when we have people who are immigrants, immigrants, trans migrants, refugees at the same time, or in different contexts. So they are changing their statuses. They are uh, belonging to different contexts at the same time. And uh, this makes for historians very hard to create a narrative for these indiv migrating individuals. But uh, at the same time, it also, as I already said, uh, creating a huge challenge for the lineal understanding of these uh, processes. Uh, so let's uh, move a bit back to the uh, Russian Empire and uh, uh, discuss what is happening in other uh, regions, uh, non-Western one, and uh, uh, what is happening kind of before this Galician crisis I described. So uh, 
in the period from 8081 to 8084, uh, scholars counted 259 pogroms. Uh, we are speaking about programs that were recorded by authorities and we have no chance to know about those that just happened without uh, like making proper records by police or by other authorities of the Russian Empire. And um, as I mentioned, first program happened in April in Gilisadekat, uh, but uh, it's quickly spanned, you see on this map, on the territories that is nowadays uh, southern and central uh, Ukraine, so um, regions that was called uh, uh, southwestern Bubernians of the empire. Uh, and uh, in these regions uh, marked with darker color, uh, we have most of the programs in the 80s, and only some of them happened in the western border regions. Um, of course, uh, usually we are saying about pogroms of 8081-8082, but uh, uh, different episodes of violence were happening much longer until summer of 8084. But of course, um, this episode after 8082, it was like uh, rare cases, which uh, not uh, we, are, we are not uh, speaking about huge rights uh, in the 8083 and 8084. Um, and uh, uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, most of cases uh, of these rights ended without any fatalities. And uh, as I told uh, already, uh, the main target of the pogromist in 80, 1880s was the Jewish property. Uh, which is important uh, for um, um, understanding uh, uh, the dynamic of these uh, programs, uh, but of these rights. But at the same time, it's not uh, um, kind of uh, argument to uh, explain that uh, uh, these um, rights were not, not so dangerous or so. I mean, attack on the property with violent uh, accidents around is also uh, dangerous, and it's also could be an argument to decide to uh, to, to decide to escape this area. Uh, and uh, um, about uh, so, so the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the mechanisms of the pogroms is in in the middle of this uh, very debated uh, topic, and uh, it's still there is no still common and understand, understanding among scholars what was the main mechanism of these rights. Uh, the very uh, popular in the seventies and eighties explanation. Uh, but of the pogroms uh, geography by railway connection is not supported by many of uh, scholars nowadays and uh, um, uh, also any uh, ideas about uh, concrete ethnic or class belongings of the pogromists uh, cannot be supported if we look uh, supported with sources material if you look at a variety of cases. However, in some particular cases, of course, we could see that pogromists belong to a particular class or language or religious group. Um, and uh, uh, But generally, the pogromists are multi-ethnic group uh, who, um, of course, linked to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and in many places, uh, the pogroms, uh, that's the reason why they were happening uh, mostly in the spring, you know, both in 1881 and 1882, uh, pogroms were connected to the uh, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox celebrations, uh, but still uh, we cannot also see clear connection between Orthodox Church or between Orthodox religion here as a mechanism and as a uh, explanation for the uh, pogroms. Um, and uh, moving to the main our question, uh, what actually, how actually pogroms affected uh, 
any kind of mobility and migration. So as I told previously, uh, imperial sources are kind of ignoring any uh, mobility and migration. And uh, uh, there are different explanations, uh, uh, partly because uh, state uh, bureaucrats were not able to control and properly report movement of Jews during the violence. On the second um, hand, uh, this uh, kind of movement uh, shows uh, inability of uh, police, let's say, to react in this uh, dangerous situation. And it's not something they, that they would like to report to their superiors. But from the uh, EDDA documents, from the uh, press materials, we uh, see that in most of cases of the programs in 1880s and uh, same uh, works for uh, most of latest uh, uh, anti-Jewish rights, both in, uh, in the beginning of 20th century and then during civil war. So, it, so each of uh, these waves of violence um, push uh, some mechanism of uh, uh, population movement. Uh, we are not always speaking about tr transcontinental migration or even international migration, rather opposite. In most of cases, we are speaking about uh, uh, in-region mobility when people were escaping their cities for very short period, usually uh, two, three days, just to uh, prevent like being uh, physically caught by pogromists or just waiting until army or the police uh, entered the city and uh, influenced the danger, uh, a dangerous situation there. So we see many of these movements, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot trace them with the, due to the lack of the sources. And uh, here I would like to again, uh, make this point that uh, uh, only the state border with Austro-Hungarian Empire became a, a, a point where historians could trace this movement due to um, uh, existing border regime and due to uh, Austrian willingness to report this unrest on the Russian side. So uh, basically, bigger part of this uh, forced mobility, a bigger part of these Jews escaping from the uh, violence in their towns and cities, bigger part of these cases are not visible for us at all. And we have no idea how many thousands of people left their uh, pl uh, places of residence due to uh, the violence. Uh, and uh, of course, situation of uh, 1880s, uh, when Jews are just uh, uh, cross, uh, crossing the border and moving somewhere, uh, someone else is not very typical. As uh, you uh, may know, uh, there, there were quite a lot of restriction for Jews uh, to uh, restriction for Jewish movement in the Russian Empire. There were pale of settlements, which of course did not have some clear existing border lines, but still uh, state were trying to control um, movement of Jews beyond this pale and uh, even with uh, different su uh, success on, in this process, but still it was uh, rather, uh, rather line of limitation for internal mobility. Uh, same goes for international uh, border crossing. Uh, we know that uh, in, in Jewish case, empire uh, was uh, more uh, liberal in terms of uh, letting Jews uh, cross borders of the, of the empires. The same situation we could see for uh, Poles uh, in the uh, western part of empire. Uh, some scholars explain this kind of uh, liberal po policy as uh, way for uh, empire to uh, get rid of potentially dangerous or um, potentially dangerous population or populations that were not uh, easily integrated into imperial structures. But it's, of course, only historical uh, 
hypothesis. We don't have such documents produced by bureaucrats or so. And in 1880s, uh, after Jews end up waiting for their uh, for their movement to the West in Galicia. Actually, uh, in, in some cases, Russian state show some uh, concern and willingness to uh, receive these Jews back. But at the same time, we have cases when uh, uh, some particular bureaucrats are creating uh, also some troubles to Jews who are trying to return to the Russian Empire. So it's rather uh, rather complicated uh, and very different uh, cases we see on the ground that are very different from general imperial policy. Uh, but uh, situation of crossing border, what is main here, what's the main point here is not uh, in the 1880s is not typical and normally and officially was very complicated. Uh, uh, bureaucratical procedure, including receiving passport for state, authori state authorities, including paying uh, quite big fees for considering this passport case, etc. Uh, so, from what we from what I already uh, said, we see that uh, there is no direct link between uh, pogrom appearing somewhere in the Russian Empire and Jews arriving to this Ellis Island or other uh, uh, Ellis Island in New York in the US or other Western European or North Atlantic country. But um, the question remains how it happens that in mass understanding and in uh, Jewish memory and in Jewish historiography, we have this idea that uh, maybe not a majority, but a significant part of the Jews uh, came to the United States, came to this uh, so-called West uh, because of the persecution and because of the uh, anti-Semitism. And um, uh, here, of course, uh, as I already mentioned, we have uh, the problem with, you know, the, the issue with uh, uh, echo documents and with Jewish memoirs about migration that uh, Many of them are affected with experiences of the 20th century and uh, the previous waves of uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, rights are somehow understood in the, in the context in the new context that 20th century bring to Jewish history. Uh, that, of course, create this image of uh, pogroms uh, pushing. Uh, Jews from the uh, empire, uh, but uh, the main reason for this uh, mythological understanding and lineal understanding of connection between violence and uh, uh, westward migration is a historiographical one, and um, uh, we have, uh, as for as for today, we have uh, many great uh, scholars who are considering uh, Jewish uh, migration from economical, uh, demographical, and other, um, and other uh, contexts. And uh, these people are, uh, my colleagues are uh, proving that uh, main uh, pushing factor uh, was uh, soci socio-economical one and uh, economic hardship in the empire and violence rather became a mechanism and uh, 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 pre uh, uh, and uh, context for living at the certain point, but not the co uh, but not the uh, but uh, did not cause immediate uh, escape from the uh, region. However, uh, even having this uh, many uh, uh, new investigations that challenge this understanding, uh, a historiographical understanding, we still, even in recent publication, uh, we see uh, this idea presented. And usually, uh, these people are um, um, uh, rely on the Jewish historiography, um, uh, Jewish American historiography from the uh, mid uh, 20th century. And um, 
Mm, actually, uh, exactly in uh, 1940s and 1930s, uh, generation of historians who were uh, migrants themselves created uh, quite strong narrative uh, about uh, Jews, uh, uh, Jewish migration beginning in the 1880s, uh, pogroms being main push factor and Galician refugee crisis uh, being uh, first step in, uh, in this westward migration. And uh, here uh, you see uh, some of the significant representatives of this uh, generation of uh, Jewish historians who were migrants themselves. So Mark Wischnitzer in his uh, book that uh, probably some of you uh, could be familiar with, uh, it was a book to dwell in safety, the story of Jewish migration since 1800. And uh, he created fundamental historical narrative um, about uh, lasting Jewish exodus from Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, Wischnitzer uh, uh, basically is saying that mass migration uh, started after 1881, and uh, in this way, uh, he is uh, some kind of, uh, somehow ignoring previous movement of Jews, previous westward migrations that existed, of course, be before 1881, and uh, uh, with using this 1881 as an image, as a symbol of migration, we of course uh, putting into the shadow all other. Uh, all, all other contexts for this migration. Uh, two other people who worked uh, with Wischnitzer uh, uh, together in uh, YIVO, uh, so Yiddish uh, Scientific Institute, uh, Yiddish Wissenschaftliche uh, Institute in New York that was moved from Europe uh, in the uh, early 1930s uh, to, the, to New York. Uh, it's uh, Zosia Shaykovsky and um, Elias Cherikova. Uh, both of them, uh, before uh, coming to Ivo, uh, spent some time in Paris where they were working with uh, Alliance Israeli documents. So the same Alliance Israeli that was leading this relief action uh, that supported westward migration of uh, pogrom refugees. And actually here we have very interesting connection when uh, uh, we see creation of historical uh, mythology uh, driven by uh, historical sources. So basically uh, they uh, built their uh, narrative, both of them on uh, historical sources uh, uh, from uh, Mm. Alliance Israeli Archive in Paris and uh, uh, Hebrew Immigration Association in New York. And of course, uh, these associations that were specialized in the 1880s on uh, collecting donations from uh, Western uh, Jewish elites and sending them, and, and also not non Jewish elites, and sending them to Eastern Europe to support migration. Of course, in their documents, this organization portrayed uh, most of Eastern European Jewish population as uh, those who are affected by the pogroms and those who are in need to uh, escape the Russian Empire. And uh, in this case, of course, uh, um, the uh, research by uh, of Tchaikovsky and Cherikover, uh, even uh, being uh, supported by historical documents, were um, very uh, were uh, very linear in terms of connection uh, Jew uh, anti Jewish violence and uh, uh, migration uh, and uh, as I said even nowadays we see uh, many uh, references to these authors and even nowadays we see uh, in in many uh, research, uh, academic literature, but uh, also textbook, and especially in mass culture, uh, uh, ideas that po uh, 
ideas of um, Jewish migration from Eastern Europe beginning in 1881 and uh, being caused by uh, pogroms, uh, solo uh, po pogroms context. And uh, as I mentioned, many scholars today are uh, deb debating and um, uh, uh, trying to uh, st stress this uh, existing uh, uh, this existing image, for example, um, so I ju I'll just mention a few. So uh, uh, Benjamin Lukin from Benjamin Lukin from uh, Central Historic Historical Archive of the History of Jewish People in, in Jerusalem has investigated Galician crisis in detail and. Uh, uh, providing a lot of fruitful uh, material to see how uh, multiple was movement of these uh, people. Janai Spitzer from Hebrew University is uh, studying uh, economical and uh, demographic aspects of the Jewish migration in the 20th century to the United States. And also he's arguing that pogroms uh, could be uh, seen as one of many context, uh, many contexts to uh, leave the empire, but uh, they they are not main push factor. Uh, and many other scholars, I just mentioned to Israeli one if, uh, because they also have uh, some publications in uh, Hebrew, uh, are uh, stressing this um, idea, and uh, uh, that is also what I'm doing in my research by investigating uh, these records and investigate uh, of migrants and investigating their origin, how it's correlate with pogrom. We um, see uh, very, uh, very uh, so variety of uh, different explanations for this uh, westward migration. So to uh, sum up. Uh, I will um, probably stop sharing now. And uh, to sum up, uh, I just would like to say that pogroms, of course, became a powerful impetus for a population with uh, movement with complex reason uh, for a population with complex reason to emigrate. The anti Jewish rights and the Galician refugee crisis did not mark the beginning of Jewish mass immigration. However, the events of, 80, uh, of 1880s pushed Jewish migrations to a new transnational level. The involvement of international Jewish organizations became one of the key factors in this process. They took the uh, movement of refugees and uh, refugee crisis in Galicia under control and contributing to, solve it, uh, to solving it through their resources and moral authority. And they launched international debates among Jewish elite in Western countries to deepen understanding of problem of Jews in the Russian empire. Uh, therefore, uh, the uh, pogroms and uh, um, crisis in Galicia became a, an issue of international debate. Uh, uh, and uh, these debates made a priority of the uh, Jewish migration for different organizations and Jewish communities around the globe for, uh, globe for several subsequent decades. Uh, as um, my and many other studies shows anti-Jewish violence triggered the arrival of refugees of Galicia and their further westward movement, although it had not affected a significant uh, uh, proportion of them. Evidentially, the pogroms were not the reason uh, for which Jews left the Russian Empire, but uh, still uh, could be uh, uh, considered as a trigger in uh, this context. So I will stop here. And uh, we will uh, be happy to answer now your question and maybe debate some of my points with our audience. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, there are a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, Mike asked where the maps were from. Where did you, where did you get the maps from? Uh, so maps that were shown in the uh, PowerPoint, right? So uh, the pogrom maps is from uh, 
collective volume uh, on uh, pogroms that was published in Cambridge in 1992. Uh, the uh, maps of Galicia, just part of historical maps from Vienna National, uh, Austrian National Library. And as, uh, the other maps that I have shown, it's just uh, uh, maps produced by uh, myself. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah asked uh, uh, about the population you're talking about. Um, are they mainly Russian or from areas controlled by Russia, like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, etc.? Mm, uh, yeah, actually, uh, so if we are speaking about uh, uh, Jewish population in the uh, Russian Empire, uh, we are mostly speaking about uh, Western part of empire, which is nowadays uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, uh, Bal Baltic states, and uh, uh, Central Eastern part of Poland. Uh, uh, this was the land inherited, uh, lands inherited uh, by Russian empire from the uh, Kingdom of Poland. And of course, with these lands, Russian empire inherited most of the Jewish population. Uh, so if we are speaking about uh, uh, Galician refugee crisis and this border, border movement, we are speaking mostly uh, about uh, lands that are no, uh, gubernias that are situated in nowadays uh, Ukraine. But um, generally, migration movement uh, covered uh, so most of these Jewish communities uh, with, without uh, any geographical limitations, I would say. Thank you very much. There was a whole big discussion here between many of the uh, viewers um, regarding uh, what other reasons aside from the pogroms uh, had led to uh, uh, the, the migration. A lot of people in the audience have family members uh, who who left for a, a slew of reasons, including the draft and uh, and the pogroms and the uh, many many other uh, reasons. Um, so that that's an interesting conversation. Of course, I'll send you the transcript from the chat so you can uh, read uh, about that. Also, at the end, I'll open microphones so that everyone can uh, participate and share, or th just thank the prof the doctor for uh, for the lecture. Um, Another question um, Mike had is, uh, when did they leave for Palestine? Or was that even an option that uh, was mentioned? Uh, so yes, uh, today I was speaking mainly about uh, westward migration, meaning migration uh, that uh, was happening mainly to uh, Northern uh, North American states and uh, partly to Western Europe, but of course there was a uh, another uh, few another uh, uh, few, few another patterns of movement. But let's start from the uh, basic thing that most of the Jewish population were uh, mo uh, were moving inside Eastern Europe, so they were not leaving it, but moving from smaller shtetls or villages to the bigger cities, moving between regions uh, for different, uh, uh, mostly economical and social uh, reasons. Uh, but of course, uh, we have uh, uh, people who are leaving to the Palestine, to the Ottoman Empire, back to this uh, period, and. Uh, we have here clash of uh, Zionism and of uh, territorialism. Um, very interesting uh, things that happened uh, right after the pogroms during the Galician refugee crisis, um, when so basically international organizations, uh, first of all, uh, French one uh, noticed uh, this uh, mm, arriving uh, of refugees there was uh, international debate between Jewish elites where to uh, uh, basically where to move these people, which kind of migration to facilitate. And uh, part of uh, 
uh, European Jewish elite suggested Palestine as place where these people could uh, be uh, transferred, uh, because actually uh, most of these people who arrived in Galicia, they had no means uh, to uh, for further uh, journeys, and uh, uh, basically um, those of them who had means to uh, go to another country uh, on their own, we probably just don't see in the sources, we don't see them in the report of these organizations. So there was a discussion uh, about uh, possible ways of regulating the crisis and where to basically where to send these people and Palestine was raised in this discussion, but uh, the, due to the uh, uh, majority, uh, so due to the uh, domination of French and US uh, donors uh, among supporters of uh, this, uh, ref uh, this refugee re uh, relief for refugee, it was decided to move these people to US and to the Western Europe. Uh, but it's also in interesting uh, to follow these uh, debates. Uh, actually, these debates also were happening in so-called Russian Jewish uh, press inside Russian Empire, when where we have uh, debates about uh, where Jews uh, can escape this uh, empire with the pogroms and uh, late John D. Clear uh, wrote actually uh, quite a significant part of his studies on this Russian Jewish press debates on possibilities of westward and Palestinian migration. Uh, but uh, most of movement to the Palestine is happening uh, later and uh, would be uh, rather connected to later waves of violence if we are trying to make this connection and especially uh, pogroms of uh, nine, uh, 1905 and 1906. Uh, and uh, those of you who are interested in this uh, um, West, uh, uh, so this Palestinian vector, I would suggest to read uh, works, uh, st studies uh, of uh, Gurel Roy from Haifa University. Most of his works are also uh, existing in Hebrew. So he is, he, he is one of um, leading scholars as for today who uh, explore this movement from the Russian Empire to Palestine. Thank you very much. Uh, Risa asks, what, are, what were the factors that led to the greatest number of pogroms during uh, occurring in Kiev, Kershon, and um, Ekaterinoslav? Uh, yeah, I, I touched already uh, this briefly that uh, we mainly see uh, to the biggest wave of the pogrom in 1881 and 1882, we mainly see in this uh, uh southern uh, provin uh, provinces of empire and uh, mm, uh, some ways to explain it uh, uh, as for example railway connection is not unique for most of cases and when a um, group of scholars or british scholars try to trace day by day first months of violence when they were preparing uh, uh, for publication book of uh, uh, John Clear after uh, his death, they were preparing his last book for publication and they try this uh, day by day uh, um, to, to build this chronology by day by day uh, uh, chronology of pogroms in 1881, uh, in uh, basically in April and May, they have seen that uh, railways are not crucial for spreading of uh, the violence. But as, as I already uh, mentioned, that in most of cases, we can see uh, some particular social groups that are mobilized uh, for the um, for the violence, in many cases, it's uh, railway workers. In many cases, it's uh, um, peasants from uh, surrounding surrounding villages. In if we are moving uh, further to the 20th century and uh, are speaking about 1905, we see that uh, many proletarians uh, united by same uh, workplace, for example. Um, 
team of some workshop at, uh, or some factory uh, could join the program in uh, ma in mass uh, scale. So we see how the social uh, connections are working, but um, these groups has has no uh, clear national or religion identification and. Uh, um, what is, if we are speaking about mechanisms, what is important is, of course, uh, uh, knowledge sharing and uh, the idea, well-known fact that the, the idea spread by uh, uh, agitators that Jews are um, mm, uh, uh, dangerous for the Tsar and for the, uh, and, and they took uh, part in the, uh, um, in this uh, teracts in St. Petersburg, so these ideas and this propaganda, which of, of course was uh, uh, f f fake news, but uh, for that time, uh, it, it of course moved uh, a lot of uh, pogromists, but we don't see a clear political or social um, face of um, this movement. And of course, I already mentioned it, but if um, audience are asking, it's important to have Orthodox Church in mind. And uh, in case of uh, programs of, eight, uh, of the winter of 8081, 8082 Catholic Church in mind, because uh, in case of both, both churches, we see priests as agitators who are supporting pogromists. And we see that uh, in case of, uh, uh, Christmas celebration in uh, Catholic Church and uh, Eastern celebration in Orthodox Church. These uh, religious celebrations, in many cases, turned into the pogroms, uh, which, of course, could be some scholars explaining just with, with uh, amount of alcohols that are traditional for this kind of celebrations. But still, uh, we see uh, some uh, church propaganda and. Uh, uh, traditional Christian um, uh, Im imagination that moved um, these uh, pogromist minds and, uh, of course, was part of knowledge spreading about possibility and need of the pogroms. Thank you very, very much, Doctor, for your answers. There are many compliments in the chat room uh, about the lecture. And uh, as I said, some conversations that were really uh, exciting to read uh, and moving. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphones on uh, for whoever's in the panelist room so that you can say thank you or ask any more questions, whoever's in the attendee room. Um, thank you again, Dr. Alexei uh, Shabatarov. Uh, thank you all for being here with us this evening. Uh, I see your hand up, Emily, uh, so you'll be first to ask, and the microphones are open. Yeah, thank you for the lecture. It was uh, wonderful to hear some new information. Thank you very much. I just wanted also to say thank you both to uh, Dr. Chibatrov and also to uh, the hosts of the National Library. And I did want to ask about the links for access. I didn't quite understand because the chat was going by so fast. Will we be informed um, in any way by virtue of having signed up for the lecture that links or the information from the chat will be available? That's a question more for the hosts. Than yeah, I guess that's a question for me. Uh, no, uh, we, we don't reach out to people to let them know that the um, events are online. It usually takes us about uh, two or three days to get one online, uh, maybe uh, less uh, when we're more fortunate. Um, the link is, uh, is the link that I'll paste now once more. Uh, just, uh, just click on the link and go in there and you can, you can save it to your favorites. and. There's uh, actually for the past uh, two years of COVID, there's probably uh, about 600 or 700 events, uh, mostly in Hebrew, but there are a lot of international events in English as well. Uh, you're most welcome to, to view. They're all extremely interesting. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions or uh, comments or thank yous? Uh, I, I had a, uh, just a question. Um, 
My it turns out that uh, my grandmother and her family, uh, their name was Rappaport, and they were from Volochiska. I have never heard from any of my family about this pogrom, and now I have to go back and check the dates. But my question is, uh, after the pogroms in Volochiska in uh, 1881, what was the Jewish population? Do you have any idea uh, how many remained in Volochiska after 1881, after the pogrom and the refugees? Actually, Volochiska provides quite interesting case, uh, as I mentioned, due to the pogrom line allowing us to catch uh, all these movements back and forth. And uh, um, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, not, not uh, so very quickly, Volochiska uh, get the same uh, Jewish population as it was before the pogrom. And uh, uh, in the late 80s and in the uh, 1890s, we see grow of this community. So pogroms, is not, pogroms are not dis destroying uh, the uh, social uh, mechanism of the town. Uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, might contradict with some uh, general imagination on it. And uh, yeah, if you uh, can uh, share with me later uh, some information about your family uh, and their story in Volochiska, it would be very helpful. It would be very grateful. Be very happy to. Okay, thank you all once more. Uh... Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Tadarba. Thank you very much to your author for coming and for listening to me till the end. Thank you. Bye bye.